respond to the confession of faith with me uh, while you're seated, if you would. Um, I'm going to say the question, and you will respond with the answer with me. Christians, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but the long body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all of these must work together for my salvation, because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. What must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Now, Michael will lead us through your suggested hymn melodies. Your chance to uh, call out your favorite hymn that we've not sung over the last 12 months. I have a very strict <clears throat> rule. If I don't know it, you have to come play. <laughs> <laughs> there was one time somebody called out a number I didn't recognize. I think it might have been Ben Moles. I said, I may not know that. He said, oh, yeah, you'll know it. And it was out by the way. Take a hymn book. Grab a number. Speak a, speak a title. Somebody. Who? 317. 317. 317. We'll sing the first verse. Oh, it's only good. one verse. <laughs> it's just one verse. It's good Gaither. One, one of the best Gaither songs ever written. 317. 317. Five 
Basically what Gideon does is he goes after 15,000 of the Midianites and the eastern peoples that were still left. Remember, there was 135,000 enemies that had been ravaging the Israelites' land for seven years. And so now Gideon decides he's going to go after these 15,000 and he's going to get the Midianite kings. And he does get them. He even asked his son to kill them. And his son refuses. He's just a boy. And so Gideon kills them. And it turns out that Gideon killed them because they had killed his older brothers. So this is a little bit of revenge going on with, with Gideon. And uh, not the character that we have gotten to know as we've uh, so loved the story of Gideon. But, uh, I mean, Gideon's battles are over, but uh, he is now forced to face the greatest trial of his life. So think about it. Gideon is a man who went from be believing he was a nobody to finding out that he was somebody to the point of thinking he had become better than anybody. And that's a scary place to be, a very dangerous place to be. So listen to the Word of God from Judges chapter 8, verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. And they answered, we'll be glad to give it. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace 40 years. Jared Baal, which is his new name, son of Joash, went back home to live he had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abiez rites. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this, your word. Help us as we study through this and unpack this. Give us grace in our understanding. And Lord, give us grace that we might be your humble people and battle pride through the power of your spirit every single day. I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Proverbs 16, verse 18 is a verse that I've uh, remembered for, for many, many years and I try to preach it to myself. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Thomas Huxley stated in 1902, a man's worst difficulties begin when he is able to do as he likes. And that's really what happened to Gideon. And so one side of success is victory, acclaim, and advancement, but success also has a dark side, including temptation, pride, arrogance, and a tendency to forget God which is what has happened here. Incredibly, most of us would admit that even if success does come with temptation, some of us believe it's the kind of temptation we'd like to try. Gideon learned the hard way that there's another side to success. So let's look at the three temptations that come with success. Number one, you can be tempted to think too much of yourself. If you're following the outline, your blanks are think too much of yourself. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. A wonderful chapter in Romans begins with, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And a lot of times the focus is on those two verses, but then we forget verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, 
Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Another translation puts it this way. Instead, think sensibly. Augustine and Aquinas both taught that pride was the root of sin. That it was and is the great sin. And in the same way, Calvin, Luther, and many others taught the same thing, that pride is the devil's most effective and most destructive tool. And honestly, thinking of yourself with sober judgment is not very easy in the world in which we live. In April of this year, the Atlantic reported that the United States is experiencing an extreme teenage mental health crisis. In 2009, about a quarter of high school students said that they had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. By last year, it was up to 44%, the highest level of teenage sadness ever recorded. And for girls, that rate rose to 57%, which means that almost six out of every 10 teenage girls feel persistently sad or hopeless. The article's author pointed to the most obvious culprit. If you stood a teen from 2009 next to a teen from 2022, what would be the most noticeable difference between them? And the answer is, one would have a cell phone in her hand. Now, I know that's a scary thing to think about, especially if you know and love a teenage girl, which underscores the need for all of us to understand how social media is shaping us. And at the other end of the spectrum, when you succeed at something, whatever it is, you can be inclined to, to draw conclusions about yourself that are a little, how should I say it, overblown. And oftentimes it's other people, in fact, sometimes it's significant other people in our lives who put this stumbling block in front of us. So look with me at verse 22 of the text again. It's the first verse of our text, verse 22 of chapter 8 of Judges. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us. You, your son, your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And what to some might have appeared to be a, a gesture of gratitude was actually an act of worship, an act of idolatry. And Gideon knows that he did not defeat their enemies. He knows that it was the power of God that gave them the victory, so he refused their offer. At least at first, Gideon sees their request for what it is. They want him to become king. So look at verse 23. But Gideon told them, I, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Okay, so far so good. And when it comes to ministry, it is a common mistake to elevate the means above the real source of success. Gideon may not have, been, have given in to the temptation of pride, but he was even less successful when it came to the second great temptation of success. So the first one, you can be tempted to think too highly of yourself. The second temptation, you can be tempted to advance yourself. If it is true that it is God who brings about success in our lives, and I believe that it is, then if we're not careful, we can at some point use the success that God brings as a platform for advancing our own interests. So after enjoying his great victory over the Midianites and the Amalekites, Gideon, once the people asked him to rule over us, he said no. But then he said in verse 24, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. <laughs> we just thought our society came up with that, right? As the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there is nothing new under the sun. So in verse 25, the, the, the people said, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. And verse 26 says, the weight of the gold rings that he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, which is about 43 pounds. Although Gideon refused to accept the office of king in many ways, 
he began to live like a king. Look at verse 30, just a little bit down below. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Interestingly enough, Abimelech means my father is king. Gideon wasn't king, but even so, he did what kings a lot of times would do, is he took many wives to himself, even though the law of God forbid that. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17 reads, the king must not take many wives, or his heart will be led astray. And so later on, Abimelech even assumes that a son of Gideon should succeed him in chapter 9, verse 2. And I think the greatest danger of an attitude of entitlement is the way it causes me to view myself. And that's what's happening in Gideon's heart. Consider this, if our Lord Jesus Christ were to evaluate your success as a Christian today, he would only want to know one thing. Who are you serving? So look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in the back of the New Testament, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So you can be tempted to think too much of yourself. You can be tempted to advance yourself. And in the third temptation, the final temptation, you can be tempted to idolize yourself. Now, I, I just have to tell you, in case you don't know this about me, I, I love to watch movies. Uh, I really like watching movies with Denzel Washington. He's one of my favorites. If he's in it, I usually want to see it. He's unusually grounded, which is, I mean, unusually grounded for an actor. And a lot of it he attributes to his mom and his dad. So I want you to listen to a conversation he once had with his mother. Denzel says, when I was young and started really making it as an actor, I came home and talked to my mother and said, Mom, did you ever think this was going to happen? That I'd be so big and I'd be able to take care of everybody and I could do this and I could do that. Mama Washington reprimanded her son. Oh, you did it all by yourself. I'll tell you what you can do by yourself. You go outside, you get a mop and a bucket, and you wash those windows all by yourself, superstar. <laughs> she said, boy, you stop it right here. You stop it right there. You stop it right there. If you only knew how many people have been praying for you, boy. He went on to say how many prayer groups his mother had called upon and called together. How many prayer talks she gave. How many times she splashed him, he said, with holy water. He says, quote, to save my sorry behind, end of quote. You know, there's this progression, if you read through Gideon, that's not good. And Gideon began to view himself as an oracle of God. Verse 27, it says, Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Now, as I said, Gideon was not even a king, but years later, there was a king named Uzziah. Uzziah was 16 years of age when he became king, and he reigned 52 years. And here's what the Bible says about Uzziah. His fame, this is 2 Chronicles 26, his, fa his fame spread far and wide, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. So was Gideon a success? Well, yes, he was, but along with his success came temptations. And if you're looking at your outline, there's at least three temptations. The temptation of pride, the danger that he would exalt himself. Secondly, the temptation of entitlement, the danger that he would advance himself. And then thirdly, the temptation of transference, the danger that he would put himself in God's place and idolize himself. Now Gideon is a reminder as to how easy it is to stumble. It's also a reminder as to how easy it is to not finish well. You know, um, 
Think about the people in the Bible that did not finish well. King David did not finish well. His son Solomon did not finish well. Hezekiah did not finish well. So don't miss this. It does not get easier to live the Christian life the older you get. It gets harder. And you need to look at yourself in the mirror every day. And think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Which says, no, tempt no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. But verse 12 is often forgotten in 1 Corinthians 10. And so I'm going to turn to that real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is a short verse, but a powerful verse. I quoted to you 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is one of my memory verses. But a memory verse that we should all have is verse 12. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And in Gideon's case, the more God gave to Gideon, the less he felt he needed God. And the farther from, de from dependence on God, he drifted. Apart from God, men can fall so far, so fast, and not even realize it at the time. Gideon lived many more years. And Israel enjoyed peace for those 40 years. This is the last time we'll be told that the Israelites lived in peace. The last time. Because after Gideon's death, things only got worse. And so for the follower of Jesus Christ, the position of real success is not at the top of the ladder. It's at the foot of the cross. Which is why we confess our faith in worship each Sunday. We confess our faith to one another. We preach the gospel to ourselves. We remind ourselves of what we believe so that when we leave this place, we can live by the grace of God that gospel. Because our hope is only in Jesus Christ and Him crucified and what He has done for us. Not in anything that we have ever accomplished. Which leads us to our verse of the week, which is Galatians 6, verse 14. I ask you to read it out loud with me. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Gideon, who is a lesson to us. A lesson to us, Lord, about the temptations of success, and about the temptation of pride to uh, exalt ourselves, to idolize ourselves, to advance ourselves. Uh, Lord, these are scary, scary temptations, and everyone is subject to them. Young people, men and women. And I pray, Father, for your grace to protect us from ourselves, that you might keep our eyes upon you, Lord Jesus, that we might honor and glorify you in the life that we live. Bless this church, Lord. May you be merciful to this church as we keep our eyes upon you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Lord's table that we welcome everyone who believes and trusts in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior too. Uh, but the Word tells us to refrain from coming to the table if we are unsure of our salvation um, and if our hearts are set with Christ. And this is what always gets me. And with each other. Uh, if your heart isn't set right with one another, uh, we should even remain in it. Uh, but Christ sets our heart right uh, against those that we sin against Him and with each other when we confess our sins. And that's what we'll do after uh, that trip will lead us through. Uh, parents, we reserve communion for those children who have met with a pastor. Uh, the only purpose in this meeting is to make sure that they trust and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If your child would like to meet with us, we'd be happy to set that up at your convenience. Uh, Today's meal might need a little bit of instruction. Uh, we use these uh, cups today because the kitchen was a little busy. Um, and so uh, what you'll find is there's two layers. There's a top layer that is cellophane. You'll pull that out. Um, and then the second layer is the, the one that separates the juice. So you'll pull that one next time. We would love for you to take it together uh, just like we do in Christmas. But when we come to the table, we are acknowledging that there has been a sacrifice made for us. And we both remember that sacrifice. But by faith, we feast on that sacrifice, acknowledging that Jesus' death, his sacrifice, his perfect life in our place is our hope. And so by faith, we really do commune with Jesus. But as we come to the table, we acknowledge our sin, our need of a sacrifice. So please pray with me the corporate confession of sin, which is printed in the mold. God of love, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fall. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us and renew our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now please take a moment in silence to confess your own sin privately before the Lord. Lord, when we're honest with ourselves and with you, we can say to you that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have turned from you. We have not come to you as we ought. We have thought too highly of ourselves. We have thought too little of others. But most heinously, Lord, we have not thought at times that you are worthy of our lives and more. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have sent your Son to live the life that we failed to live but also to die the death that we who believe in Jesus will never have to die. We will never be separate from the Lord. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. And with the scriptures, we acknowledge that all the prophets testify about Christ, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And because of your great kindness, Lord, and your great humility and your great nearness, we ask that you would even set apart these simple elements bread and wine for your supernatural purpose, that today we might not only be reminded of your sacrifice in our place, but Lord, by faith, we might even feast on your son, Jesus, because he is the hope of the world. It's in his mighty name, and for your great glory that we pray. Amen. All right, if you would take, uh, take your bread out, which is removing that top cellophane layer. And as Bo said, we will partake of the bread together uh, at the end of the words of institution. And on the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had blessed it, he gave thanks. And he broke it and said, take this, eat this. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Do this also in remembrance of me. You would put your elements away in the bag you just provided and seal it. Then it will be picked up a little bit later by our deacons. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's stand as we sing together, Who You Say I Am. <laughs> This is everybody enjoy what the women in ministry have prepared in our church. And I hope that you'll stay around, have lunch with us, and enjoy this fellowship together. Hope you uh, have a wonderful day and week. And now may God's grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.